bring on Krista Wolf, CEO and co-founder of MySpace, and Edgar Bromfen, CEO and chairman of Warner Music Group. You guys here? Did I stop you? Hey, Chris, how you doing, man? Where's Edgar? He didn't leave me, did he? I guess it's just us. Oh, he's just getting mic'd up. How you doing, Edgar? Good, John. How you doing? Thank you for coming. Have a seat. All right. Uh, wow. So, MySpace music works pretty nicely, don't you think? Um, so far, so good. Except you guys don't have a CEO. This has been like the longest running announcement of a new company that doesn't have a leader. When are we going to find out? Right now? Right here? You're going to tell us who it is? No, um, it's actually been uh, a difficult position to fill because there's so many variables that we're looking for. We're looking for, you know, someone that loves music, understands music, has been in the music industry, um, but yet understands technology and understands user experience. So we literally interviewed 40 people. Um, it came down to one person. We didn't, we've only made one offer and we're very confident that um, we'll be able to make an announcement in the, in the very near future. There's been uh, press reports that it's a person from MTV. I, I don't know anything about those press reports. <laughs> um, and her name, her last name's Holt. So you guys can Google that. Um, I don't want to screw up the negotiations or anything. I was just wondering <coughs> if you're going to spring her from the wings over here. But uh, congratulations if it occurs. I know you've been waiting a long time for that. Um, I want to start, Edgar, with you. Uh, and talk first about the music industry. Um, we've had a music discussion almost every year here at Web2 for five years, and almost every time the person who was from the industry who came, I almost always had to prepare back in the green room to get, you know, booed and hissed by the audience for a lot of things. Suing the customers, really bad DRM, uh, an approach towards the industry which, which did not embrace openness or, or, or uh, um, you know, uh, sharing of, of musical, uh, you know, tastes. Uh, basically, the approach to music seems to have been from the industry to ignore the customer and protect the hell out of whatever we got. Um, how is Warner Music different? Because you formed this seemingly with a different philosophy. Well, I'd say the first, the good news is um, that I need no preparation uh, to be uh, for booing and hissing. Uh, I've kind of generally been booed and hissed for a very long time. Um, the, uh, but I, look, when I came to Warner, uh, it was the beginning of 2004. Um, and, you know, our focus was really that if we were going to grow, we were going to have to innovate. And so focusing on innovation rather than litigation was really uh, our strategy. Uh, our goal was, was never to keep the customer from something that the customer wanted, but rather to find a way to give the customer, the consumer, everything they wanted, and to do that in a way uh, that we could monetize that interest, uh, whether it was for a song, for a record, uh, or ultimately for other pieces of the music uh, uh, ecosystem. And really, until MySpace Music came along, there really wasn't that sort of whole ecosystem available to a, to a, to a consumer and certainly wasn't available in partnership with a music company. So that's one of the reasons we're so excited to, to be partnered in MySpace Music. What Steve Jobs has famously said over and over again that he doesn't make any money from iTunes. Um, music labels have over and over said they're not making any money from iTunes. And I talk to a lot of artists who say they're not making any money, but I pay when I buy music from it. So who makes money? <laughs> well, we all know the answer to that, don't we? I actually don't. <laughs> um, well. I suspect if you, if, you, if you look at the... The guy who makes the iPods? I was going to say, if you look at the price of <laughs> Apple stock in 2004 and the price of Apple stock today, even after the market meltdown, um, uh, Apple's done very well. But frankly, they deserve to do very well. They, you know, they innovated the space. Uh, they made great devices. Uh, they created a system where people could access music easily. Uh, and, and it actually, the user experience worked in getting it to a device. Uh, the, the, the issue is... There's no one uh, channel that's going to replace the CD. Uh, so artists absolutely make money from, from, from iTunes, as do the music companies, as do Apple, and that's the way it should be. Um, but it's going to take a whole series of 
uh, different business models and different channels. Uh, and, and the music industry will be a very different industry in the next five years than it's, than it's ever been. And I, I would suggest that many of its revenue will not come from the traditional sale of, certainly of a physical CD, but potentially even of a, of a download. Right. Now, Chris, explain to me why MySpace Music, why now? And, and what is different about it than, you know, alternatives like iTunes? <clears throat> yes, I think iTunes is a completely different experience. And, um, you know, I think in the, in the past, if you look at the relationship between the music companies, as Edgar sort of alluded to, and the technology companies, um, there's been a lot of friction between the two, um, or the internet users. Um, there's been a lot of friction. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to come up with a program that met the needs of the music companies, certainly the artists by definition, and the users. So if you look back at all the music companies before, you know, starting with Napster, um, there was a mi always a misalignment between the users, um, the internet companies, and the music companies. So Napster was an amazing service with, it was very easy to use, get the music you wanted, but it didn't pay the artists. Um, you know, then along came mp3.com. Um, there was no deals with the music companies, so the quality wasn't very good and you couldn't really find what you wanted. And then you have Rhapsody, which is sort of interesting, but you know, kind of confusing. So we, what we wanted to do is put together a service that paid the music companies, paid the artists, gave the users a great experience, um, made it so they didn't have to go out and steal music, and um, make sure that everyone got paid. And I think now is when everyone's ready for it, because you know, if you look at the music industry itself and CD sales being down, you know, whatever it is, 10% a year, 15% um, a year in some cases, um, there needs to be replacement streams of, of revenue. And you know, Warner's done a particularly good job. I think it's, what is it, 20% of your revenues now are coming from digital, where a few years ago it was maybe, for most companies, 6 or 7%. And um, I think this is just another one of those programs that helps replace those lost sales. And so you know, now's the right time, and we think we have the right service, and we spend a lot of time I'm coming up with the right service, and you know, again, it's an iterative process, and we're going to continue to add new. Well, how is it features. different from, for example, and you've got a streaming service, as I understand it. You also have right. a store, but but how is it different from, from, for example, Rhapsody, which you know, uh, is a streaming service? And there, I mean, there's so many differences. Um, well, you guys have ads. I've noticed that. <laughs> more ads than anyone in uh, on the internet. So. <laughs> Um, more page views, more impressions, everything. Um, um, the, the main difference is, is really community. Um, so, you know, we have the biggest uh, music community in the world. So, in the offline world, people discover new music be, be basically through their friends. And so the same thing happens on MySpace. So if I create a playlist on MySpace, um, which I can choose from tens of millions of different songs, then you'll get alerted. Um, that I just uploaded a new song to my playlist. You may think I have good taste in music. And again, it's all about discovery. Um, if you think about um, how the internet's worked over the years, and you know, t 10 years ago, it was a couple hundred people that were deciding on Yahoo or, or on some other portal what you should be consuming. You know, then it was user-generated content that just got uploaded randomly to the internet. And then now the users are really curating their content and curating what they're doing. Um, what I mean by that is they're creating their playlist and their friends are discovering music through them. And then I think the next step after that is um, collaborative filtering through a technology that says, okay, I've listened to you know, these thousands of songs and I've rated these thousands of songs and my friends are listening to this music. Here's 10 more songs that you should listen to. Um, it's a bit like you know, going to a bookstore and not knowing what to, to look for in a bookstore and then versus going to your friend's house and having him give you a book to read. Yeah. Now, Apple just rolled something like that out, the Genius Bar. So the, the humility is remarkable in their naming. Um, Edgar, I want to ask you two, two questions, but I'm going to ask the, 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 the shorter one first, which is, give me your honest opinion of Apple. Look, a Apple's done a phenomenal job. Besides I mean, that stuff. No, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, it's really true. I mean, look, no, 
It's, what is remarkable and why you have to give them so much credit is nobody else has managed to pull it off. Nobody else has been able to come up with a, with a sexy device that, that appealed to consumers, that has a user interface that was seamless, uh, that hooked up with a service where they could get the content they wanted. No one's done that. The iPod was, was introduced, I think, in 2003. Right? Here we are five years later, and there isn't a single competitive device in the marketplace. There's a reason for that. They're, they're incredibly good at what they do. Uh, you know, they're a very big customer of ours. Uh, there are lots of customers that we have that you know, ask us for things we don't want to give. There are lots of things that we ask our customers to do that they don't want to give. That's part of the normal push and pull of it, every relationship. But at the end of the day, you know, anybody who says that, you know, like it or not, that you know, Apple hasn't earned its success is wrong. They've just done a phenomenal job. Now, if my space, space music just goes to the moon and becomes a huge deal, which I'm sure it will, um, are you going to pull back from renewing or perhaps renegotiate your contract with iTunes? Look, I, I think the, the, what I would say, I mean, Chris may have a different view, is I, I don't see iTunes and MySpace Music as, as being competitive, particularly. They're very different kinds of things. You know, iTunes is a service that, that hooks up specifically to a device. If, if you've got an iPod and you want to go buy songs, iTunes is a good place to do it. If you want to be a member of a community, if you're about discovery, if you're about sharing things with friends, you're, you're not going to be on iTunes. You're going to be on MySpace. I don't, I don't, don't see the two services as being uh, competitive in that way. And you know, we're going to be selling music and, and having people experiencing music and trying to monetize that experience in a, in a whole host of places, as we're currently trying to do. Uh, and it will, we'll continue on iTunes, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to grow MySpace music. So, Chris, I imagine that the, I'll get to that second question in a second. Uh, I imagine that the, the headline you don't want to wake up to is Apple and Facebook merge. Not really worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just hadn't thought of that before, so I'm thinking out loud I've, and I've I'll shut up on that particular John. one because <laughs> I've already tried to put Twitter and Facebook together and CNET gave me a, told me to shut up. Um, I do read the press. Um, let me ask you about your, your revenue mix. So, so Chris mentioned that you had 20% digital. Walk me through how your industry, or in your case, your company, sort of makes, you crosses the chasm of being a company that's driven by a packaged goods distribution model on, on one side and you know, a multi-channel digital world on the other. Well, I think, frankly, we've crossed the, the chasm in terms of how we've reorganized the company and, and managing these revenue streams. You know, we've gone from a very few number of large customers to, you know, literally 500 different uh, mobile agreements around the world, uh, et cetera. And, and our whole product development strategy now is different because we used to really have three SKUs when we, when we, when we uh, had a project. We had a single, we had a video, and we had an album. Um, now we have, I mean, hundreds, literally hundreds of SKUs each time we release uh, an album uh, and a single. Uh, so our whole product development strategy is different, uh, and, and everything about the company in that sense is different. I think the other thing where people, I think, have, uh, have somewhat misunderstood the, the value of music companies is that the value, at least to me when I got to Warner, uh, was n never in the distribution. Distribution fundamentally, no matter whose distribution it is, is a commodity. It, 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 so the value that we add really is both on the editorial side and on the marketing and promotion side. And frankly, those jobs are getting harder, not easier, um, as channels become much more divergent. Uh, and I think the, the need for the music company actually increases in that environment. The distribution piece of it, of course, as I said, is a commodity and we're, we're out of the physical distribution business anyway. No, that's, that's very interesting. I, um let me ask how the launch has gone, actually. Can you give me a few stats? I mean, how long has it been now? It's been about a month. So in yeah. the first month, uh, how's it gone? It's gone great. So in the first few days, there was over a billion streams. Um, so far, there's been over 80 million playlists created, um, which is just a staggering number. Um, we have over 5 million bands that are actively using MySpace to upload and promote their music and to um, communicate with their fans. So, so far, it's gone great. And do you have any goals or, or like, what is your yardstick for success? I mean, I mean the, yard, the obvious yardstick long term for success is profitability. And so we started this business um, just like we started MySpace 
to become profitable very quickly. And um, you know, I, I think a good gauge for that what would be our launch partners, um, where um, Toyota, who's sponsoring our MySpace Music Party tonight, McDonald's, State Farm Insurance, Sony, were all major launch partners. So in addition to those revenue streams, you have the download revenue streams, ringtone revenue streams, tickets, merchandise. So it's a full 360 model. So your download store is DRM free. Correct. Walk me through, Edgar, how the industry got there. Because, I mean, there was so much opposition to the idea that you might put music available on online DRM free so that people could, you know. Well, yeah, so I think that. And that is a distinction between iTunes and. Yeah, there's, there's DRM uh, uh, there. But, sure as hell it is. But um, I, I think, the, frankly, the way we got to it is that the, the, the world changed, right? Which is uh, media became social media. And, and frankly, in order for have, to have content uh, and for it to be shared in a meaningful way across MySpace or any other social media, th there needs to be a standard. Uh, and frankly, there was no way to have a standard in the world of a CD, uh, which is an o open, you know, a, you know a, a, an open digital master, uh, other than to sort of accept the fact that that was inevitable and that what we needed to monetize, you know, the DRM shouldn't be used to be restrictive. Uh, the DRM was originally intended you know, we're not technology companies, and frankly, we never came up with a, a DRM that, that did what it needed to do for consumers. Um, would I like a world where DRM was completely interoperable and, you know, people could share and we could track it more easily? Uh, yeah, that would be great, but that world isn't there. Um, and so I think, you know, part of what I think we're trying to do at Warner, and I think the rest of the industry is doing as well, is just trying to face reality and, and adapt to, to a, a very different world than any content industry has ever faced in, in, in the history of content. And, and no other kind of industry has faced, or frankly is facing, what we have faced uh, yet. So, um, you know, we've been the guinea pigs, and I can't say we've always uh, done the right thing, but I think, you know, we're, we're finding our way through it. Chris, do you think, or do you, as you plot, or, or you know, the future of MySpace, do you think there's a place where MySpace might create a device? No, it's, it's possible. Right now we're just focusing on the service itself. And, you know, we had talked a little bit about the discovery tools. And I think that's going to be really the next step in creating amazing discovery tools. And then, you know, we're also going to be creating original content with the help um, of all of our music company partners. Um, we're going to have offline events. It's going to be, um, you know, really a pop culture hub for music everywhere throughout the world. Do you, do you worry a little bit? My, little, my Facebook Apple thing was kind of a... A joke, unless it, it happens funny. tomorrow, in which case <laughs> I'll look like I know what I'm talking about. Um, but my, the reason I brought it up was, was, was pretty simple. My son is a music freak, and he loves music, and, and he has, you know, iTunes is how he understands music, but I don't let him buy stuff, because he's 12, and I don't want him to get like, in a habit of, so he shares my library, um, and, and has, you know, all our CDs, he rips them all, sorry, we don't buy two, just one. Um, and, and he, you know, but now he comes to me about uh, a month ago and says, Dad, I, I got to get an iTunes account. I got to get one. And he has like a $20 bill from his allowance. And he's like, here, get me one because you have to have a credit card, right? And I said, what, what's the big deal? Why now? 20 bucks ain't going to get you very far on iTunes. He says, I want to share my lists with my friends at school. So Apple turned on that genius bar and started the sharing thing, which you brought up. Are you concerned about that? Is that an issue that... No, I don't, I don't think Apple's really ever been, or iTunes has ever really been about community. I don't think they're focused on that. Um, I think they're focused on selling devices, and that's why I don't think that we're competitive with them. Um, as a matter of fact, I think, if anything, we're going to be accretive to their iPod sales because... You're going to put gonna more be, music on it. We're going to be putting more music on it, and everyone's going to be playing their DRM-free uh, songs that they buy on MySpace, and they're going to be playing them on their iPods. Unless we develop a device. Unless you develop a device, which is reserving the uh, option. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there's this thing called the Zune. I bet you could get it for cheap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Microsoft guys. I'm just kidding. I'm trying to, be, trying to keep it lively here. Um, Edgar, 
you know, it's, in a way, it's kind of funny the two of you are up here together because when MySpace really hit its stride, when it started taking off, and it was like, wow, there was a lot of discussion around, hey, you know, I'm a musician. I don't need a label anymore. I've got MySpace, you know, and MySpace gives me a platform to promote my band, market my band, get distribution, develop a fan base, communicate with them on a regular basis, let them know about my tours, and I'll make all my money touring and I don't need a label anymore. You mentioned earlier that you think your value is in editorial and market. Can, can you unpack that a little for us? Sure. I mean, I think MySpace in, it has been a fantastic boon to the music industry, both to artists, signed and unsigned, and, and to companies, because it's a great place uh, potentially to find talent. <clears throat> but there's very little talent uh, that's born fully formed in somebody's bedroom. Uh, you know, even if we find somebody who's got talent and has written or can write good songs or has a great voice, the amount of time that we then spend with that artist, if we invest time and money in that artist to take to what we believe is their full potential uh, and to help them with their writing, find the right producer, you know, we spend sometimes years getting from that bedroom song to a finished product. Uh, so that's the editorial voice. And as I said, there are very few people who are sort of born fully formed as, as, a, as, a, as an artist. Um, second is, you know, it takes real persistence, particularly in today's, you know, fractionated, if there's such a word, attention span. You've got to stick with an artist and you've got to continue to promote that artist to, to, to people time and time again. It actually is taking longer now to break the average artist than it ever took uh, because there's so many different, uh, you know, your attention is taken in so many different directions. So I, I would say that, that the editorial uh, issue remains important in all creative enterprises. You know, I don't know how good an author F. Scott Fitzgerald would have been without his, without his editor. Um, I, I, you know, you, you, you've got to, there, every artist needs that kind of uh, back and forth, really, to, to reach their full potential. Uh, and then marketing and promotion is, frankly, much more difficult uh, and, and necessary today than it ever was before. And the channels that you have for the marketing and promotion are quite distinct than they used to be, right? It was about radio airplay for the, the Lord knows how long. Sort of like when I was talking to Jack Clues, it was about 30-second spots on television. There's no question. I mean, basically, our marketing and promotion was restricted to uh, promotion. Right? Let's get it on the radio. People will hear it. Hopefully, they'll buy it. Um, now, it's uh, Now, you've got to buy ads on MySpace. Well, I, I don't know that we have to buy ads no. so much as we've got to get our music out in front of people. But yeah. we'll buy ads, too. <laughs> No, um, actually an interesting story. When we only had two million users, and um, it, would, it would be hard to get an appointment with uh, one of his underlings, 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 uh, when I'm knocking on the door. Um, they were coming out with a new album uh, with uh, REM, and REM hadn't come out with an album for, I don't know, three or four years, and it was anticipated everywhere. And Warner said, you know what, we're going to do this album release fully on MySpace, exclusively on MySpace. We only had a couple million uh, users at the time. And I think that really speaks to their forward thinking when you know, we couldn't get in the door anywhere else. And yeah. they're willing to take that big of a risk and convince REM to do that. Yeah. And so that's just opened up the floodgates for all kinds of other album releases. Um, you know, any, anyone from the Black Eyed Peas to Nine Inch Nails to Madonna, whoever it is. Right. Um, that, since we're talking about artists, I want to talk about Radiohead. I'm a fan. Just put that out there. Um, and what do you make of, of, of what Radiohead did, Radiohead did? It's been repeat, you know, it's been uh, imitated many times now. And, and then, you know, Radiohead the, never really <coughs> talked about how much money they garnered from first making it completely free and then going to, uh, to, to pay. But what, what's your take on that? Well, w one interesting note is we, we actually are Radiohead's publishers. I, I know. I and and we, we have a, a, a great relationship with the band. And actually, uh, they asked us to aggregate their entire digital portfolio uh, on In Rainbows. So um, ba basically, we were the one-stop shopping for anybody who wanted anything to do with that, with that album, uh, which is an unusual role for the publisher, but it speaks to our, our relationship. Look, I, I think there will be different models, particularly for... Uh, uh, artists or bands who have built up a long uh, and distinguished career, uh, you know, who, who's, you know, whose products don't necessarily need marketing or promotion and who already, you know, whose editorial, you know, is going gonna, is gonna to go out unfettered. But there are very, very few of those. 
Uh, and frankly, today, it's getting harder and harder to build a multi-year and certainly a multi-decade career than ever before. Um, but frankly, you know, I, I'm not close enough to know uh, what Radiohead's expectations were for the album sales and, and how well they did versus what their expectations were. Uh, but uh, I thought what, frankly, I was disappointed to read that, uh, you know, at a relatively low price, so many people still chose to, to take it for free, particularly people, you know, with a band like that where they've got just rabid fans, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I think that what, what that suggests is that in order to monetize music, we're going to have to find ways to monetize it other than only asking people to pay to purchase each and every time a separate uh, There's piece a, of content. There's a couple things I'm curious about there, and you might not have these, uh, this data, and, and if not, I'm not going to hold you to it. But one, I wonder how much there was, with Radiohead, there was sampling. In other words, with the amount of downloads of that album way past the number that they normally would have sold. So therefore you have people, and this is, was a big argument back during the Napster debacle, right? Which was, if you can't get the music out there and let people listen to it, they're not gonna know enough about the music to want to support it in some way and make that band bond with the band where they'll pay for the ticket to go see them, buy the next album and so on. You need to encourage sampling. So do you have any idea how much of those downloads were sampling? I, I, I don't, but I think you make, uh, I, I make a different point off of your question, which is one of the reasons the, the, the industry has also moved to a more of a 360 model, just like Chris is talking about in, in monetizing the consumer. The reason we need to be involved and as a full partner with the artist in the entirety of their career is because it may make sense in the cases of some artists to, to, to promote one piece of product in order to sell another piece of product. So you could promote records to, to, to sell tickets. You could give away tickets in order to sell records. But if we're only invested in one piece of that artist's career, we're going to have misaligned economic interests. And so are you, go going, are you representing the touring piece of your artist as well? I mean, that's got to be hard to change because there's a whole infrastructure there that... Um, we're not necessarily going to become a touring company, but every, every new artist we sign, we sign now with, with rights in all of their revenue streams. Ticketing, touring, merchandising, sponsorship. How's that going over? Um, I, I just said, we're only signing artists that way. And um, uh, we, we now have over a third of... Does that of make you the man again? <laughs> uh, we have over a third of our... We, over a third of our current roster is signed to three, with six, 360 rights. So I, I'd say it's, it's going well, not because it's taking something from artists, but because artists and managers and lawyers who are making these deals understand that the world has changed. And in order for us to make the investments that we need to make, we need to partner. Because otherwise, their interests and our interests are completely misaligned, and it, it, will, it, it hurts the career of the artists as well. Got it. Now, Chris, um, we had Mark Zuckerberg here. I gotta, I gotta bring this up. Uh, we had Mark Zuckerberg here, and, and earlier this year, and I'm, I know these numbers get odd, but earlier this year, Facebook eclipsed MySpace in terms of overall uniques in the United States. I think. No, it's no. incorrect. Incorrect. Yeah. Okay, it didn't, but it's on the way. So, are the, you concerned about this because Facebook music has been, and are you cutting a deal with them? Well, what, hold on. So let's get. To <laughs> Let's get the real numbers out there. To okay, let's with. get the real okay. numbers out there. So in the United States, if you look at Comscore, uh, MySpace is somewhere around 75 million unique users, and they're in the 40s. Um, both companies started around the same time. So um, from that standpoint, you know, both companies are very different. Um, and Mark has said it, that they're more of a utility, like a, more like email meets um, a really good calendar, meets a really good address book, and staying in touch with your friends. We're more about self-expression um, and communicating with your friends, but also discovering new people, content, and culture. And um, there's massive differences. There's some overlap. 70% of Facebook's users are on MySpace. And in addition to that, <clears throat> um, you know, we've been really focused on creating a real business. And we've been doing that since day one. And um, we've invested heavily. And um, you know, our, our revenues are up 17% year over year. And we're really happy about that. Are you worried about Facebook music? We have five million bands on, on MySpace. Um, there's massive barriers to entry to do what we did. Um, number one, you got to have the artists on the site. So again, we have five million artists. Number two, you got to have critical mass of 
of, of a music community that is passionate about music. Number three, you have to have a sales infrastructure that's very deep. Um, we have 300 people in our sales organization. We have 250 people in our sales monetization organization. Um, so, like to recreate all of those uh, three to four different variables is, is like almost non impossible. Non-trivial. I, I understand <clears throat> that someone in that business. There's mics here. Questions, please. I've got one more. Before, sorry, we'll get right to you. Um, and that is, advertising is a big piece of this. We we're just talking about that. Correct. Um, how's it? How does it work? First of all, like between you in terms of you're splitting, I assume, some of the ad, you're getting some of the ad revenue, the, the labels are getting some of the ad revenue, or? Yeah, I mean, we obviously can't talk about the deal structure. But how does it work? What do you mean, how does it work? Well, just tell so me we how it works. So we go out and sell ads, <laughs> the brands give us money, it comes into the joint venture, and, some of them, and there's a P&L in the joint venture. Right, and some, okay, and how, how does it work from the point of view of consumer? This is, and from a band's point of view, this is a bit new, the idea of having advertising and music, sort of, you know, peanut butter and chocolate, are we going to come up, is it going to be a mess or is it a Reese's peanut butter cup? I mean, like, what, what comes out of this? It's the band Reese's has always been about cup. not selling out to the man, right? So is having advertising intertwingled with music going to work? Um, I, I, if it works, and I think it will work, it, 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 it will, it, it, let me try that again. <laughs> The artist is not going to object to it. Um, th there may be one or two artists that you know, have a problem with one or two sponsors, but essentially uh, artists understand that they want to reach as broad a consumer as possible. And, uh, and the artists uh, you know, really are, are open to all of these new business models. I think if it works, it'll work because of the genius of the folks at MySpace Music and their understanding of the consumer and the people who are on the site and how to advertise to them and how to make advertising a value-added experience for the consumer rather than a, uh, an intrusion. Question. Uh, yeah, Chris Tolles with uh, Topics. Um, I used to run product for AOL Music back in 1999 when Warner Music sued the other part of Warner Brothers doing Spinner. Um, so congratulations on actually you know, moving a huge amount in the last nine years. And it sounds like the MySpace deal is working really well. I, I guess I have a question, though, of if you've said, Mr. Bronfen, that you don't want to be in the distribution business, why not open it up? I mean, the marketing and promotional aspects of the MySpace deal sound fantastic, but Google killed Yahoo in the ad market by allowing just anybody to take, put ads on their site. So just putting, creating a service where anybody can sell Warner Music on their site. Why do you have to do a deal with MySpace or a deal with Facebook? Why not just say, here's the API. You sell our stuff, here's the, you don't do a DRM. You know, here's what you gotta pay us, here are the terms. Anybody can build a music service for you. So I'm just curious, why not just allow anybody in Silicon Valley to build a service with selling your stuff as long as they meet some term where they never have to talk to a lawyer ever to make it happen? That's my question. Look, I think it's a good question. I think the, the, the question is which comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, if, if you understand the economics of selling music, as Chris was talking about, um, uh, on, on the internet, it, it's, it's not trivial, um, and, the, and the margins are very thin. We, we have actually not been besieged by people wanting to put APIs on in order to, to, to sell our music, uh, because being a, a digital retailer, and that's all, um, is really not a great place for anybody to be. Um, but I certainly think we are, we are moving to you know, a more and more and more open environment uh, because that's the way the world is going. We're going to have to figure out how to make that work and how to make that work for our, for our artists. That's, that's what we've got to do. And we're trying to innovate uh, as, as we go along. Stephen. Uh, hi, Stephen Levy for Wired. Um, uh, before I ask my question, Edgar, I believe you said the, the iPod came out in 2003. Uh, there's actually a nifty book uh, called uh, The Perfect Thing which uh, would let you Who know. wrote that book, Stephen? Oh, uh, really, uh, it, it was 2001, but I have to send you a copy. Uh, history. Uh, 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 but, I stand corrected, I'm sorry. Uh, um, the question is, it's actually sort of a variation of the, the previous one. You, you didn't say the, the terms, but are the terms that uh, the record label's giving to uh, the MySpace Music uh, collaboration uh, available to anyone out, outside other companies? Uh, even if Facebook uh, wanted to go and have the same kind of terms, would they be able to use those? We're not talking about any deal terms right well, without now. Without saying what they are, I mean, if I were Facebook and I'd say to the labels, you know, hey, I want the same terms as you give to, to this other company, would that be available? Well, to, to be clear, I can only speak for Warner Music. I can't, obviously can't speak for other, other labels. But you know, we have deals in place with all kinds of distributors, from you know, mobile carriers to mobile manufacturers to 
uh, social networks like MySpace to iTunes. Um, you know, I, I, I can't say I can't I don't can't say it's a utopian world where you can get there by not speaking to a single lawyer, but but we're prepared to make a deal with just about anybody who wants to sell well, our music. The difference is that since you, that you're the partnership there, um, whether someone would feel that they're competing against all the groups together, and whether you'd be concerned about an antitrust suit uh, if you didn't give those terms. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the reference, but you know we're very thoughtful about how how we construct our, 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 our agreements so that we, you know, we're very respectful of the laws and, and antitrust. So I, I don't expect we'll have any issues there because we're very careful okay. to. Yeah, I, I guess because actually I, I just don't understand how that works, whether that would put you in a kind of jeopardy or not. No, no, I, look, I, I think what was the genius of, of, of what Chris did as far as the music industry is concerned, obviously he did some phenomenal things just to create MySpace, was to recognize that we actually could be a partner rather than an, an enemy. And it was Chris who came to, to the industry uh, one by one and said, look, I have a vision for how to really make a music, a, a music site fully formed for consumers and fully formed for artists and for the people who, who own the copyrights along with the artists. That, that, was a, that was a vision that Chris came with 16, 18 months ago. And it's taken a long time to build it out and get it to the place that it is. And obviously, it's still early days, and it's, the, the site's going to grow and improve. But you know. Making the music industry uh, and, the, and the artists a partner in this social network and this community is, is a, I think, a great thing. Uh, and, and so our economics at MySpace Music are different than our economics at iTunes, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we have deals with, with both. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right, we have, we're running already late, so this will have to be the last question. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my name is Gary Zellerbeck. I work for Sun Microsystems. I'm a former professional musician. As television moves to high def and as the internet moves to much more broadband, rich internet uh, experiences, it's curious that music has come down to MP3s, which seriously sacrifice bandwidth and quality of music. Uh, and some musicians are horrified to see MP3s become the standard because of that sacrifice. Is that something you think we're stuck with? Does the consumer care about that? Do they hear the difference? Uh, are we stuck with that forever? Would you like to see high-definition music come along at some point? I, I would look. I think there there are a large group of consumers who who, who do not hear the difference uh, and who value interoperability and you know being able to access their music anytime, anywhere more than the quality of music. But there are consumers who do care about music and who find the MP3 standard to be substandard, which is by the way one of the reasons why vinyl. Funnily enough, is growing exponentially, albeit from a small base. Would I like to see higher quality digital files available in addition to MP3 files? Very much so, and, and so would our artists. And you know, we're working on uh, on delivering that. But for the moment, the MP3 standard is is going to, I, I think, for the foreseeable future, remain the broadest standard for music distribution. And I, I would say, from the consumer point of view, um, you know, we've done polls on that, and the vast majority of consumers can't really tell the difference. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you guys very much for coming up here and helping us end day two. And by the way, thank you, MySpace, for being the music sponsor of the uh, event. V appreciate that. Um, and please join me in thanking these guys for taking the time to come Thanks talk. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody.